We're reading Acts chapter 5, verse 12 to 41. 42, sorry. And though the hands of the apo- and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly, and believers were incre- increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So no one came and told them, saying, so sorry, so one came and told them, saying, look, the men whom you put in 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 prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and saviour to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him. And when they had, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they, that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. That they, they command, sorry, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word, Lord. We just thank you that we can be gathered here just to listen to you, Lord, and listen from you, Lord, and expect you to do amazing things in us, Lord. So, Lord, we commit this time to you and ask that you by the power of your Holy Spirit, would come and do a work in each of our hearts, Lord. Um, Lord, that you give us minds and hearts to be attentive to the things that you want to teach us and want to do in our hearts, Lord. So please, Lord, transform us into the people that you want us to be in this time, Lord. Just please be with PT as he teaches, Lord, and be with us as we listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jaden. Hi, everyone.
would say today as I would any, please don't just believe me, don't assume it's true because I say so, search the scriptures. Let the Bible always be your authority. It's been less than a year since Acts chapter two. 120 people were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They received power, overcame themselves, and became witnesses. In an, an international crowd at 9 a.m. heard them declaring the wonderful works of God, and Peter testifies and says, that's just straight out of Joel too. The end times have begun. Joel's beautiful book, it's only three chapters, it's an easy one to read. The first chapter shows the great devastation of rebellion, the second, the great restoration of God's grace, and the third, what takes you from chapter one to chapter two, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter jumps on that. Quote Psalm 16 and Psalm 110 in regards to the fact that even Jesus' resurrection was foretold. And on that day, 3,000 people woke up going to hell and went to sleep embracing heaven. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers, the four, if you will, food groups that keep any Christian healthy. Reverence, signs were the product of that and they became common. And they continued temple and house to house. Someone that tells you that an in-house church is biblical, I tell you they're half right. Someone that tells you that church simply at church buildings is biblical, I tell you they're half right. They did both. And they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart and God continued to add daily to the church, those that were being saved. But chapter three, we had a pivotal moment. Among all the signs and wonders, there was a beautiful beggar. Beautiful laid at the gate, beautiful lame from birth, 40 plus now. And as he is raised up, it's Peter the mouthpiece again who says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered and you denied and you killed and freed a murderer in his place and you killed the prince of life, but God, just like he promised, raised him from the dead. And through faith in his name, this man's received perfect soundness. Now I recognize you did this in ignorance, so repent, be converted, that your sins would be blotted out. And he pulls out Deuteronomy 18. But not everybody's very excited about this newfound religion. And I want to remind you, these Jewish boys did not think they were starting a new religion. They just thought they were carrying on the one they already knew. Because every prophecy came from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament. But chapter 4, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them. They were disturbed because they taught and preached the resurrection of the dead, which happens to be a fundamental aspect that the Sadducees stood against. They were kind of the local karma people, but only of this age. If you did nice, nice will come to you, but if they couldn't see it, they wouldn't believe it. They had arrested him, put Peter and John in jail. The rulers, the elders, the scribes, the high priest's family ask by what power or what name, and they're trying to trap them with a text from Deuteronomy where it says in chapter 13 that if a person does a sign or a wonder but leads you in another name, you're to kill him. So they're playing a game of chess with them. Peter, like any of us, might have been tempted to try to figure out how to almost say the answer, but he doesn't. He goes straight for the answer. This Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised up. And then he quotes from Psalm 118, 22 about him being the rejected cornerstone. Rejected by you religious leaders, this is, you do realize even what you're doing right now is fulfilling scripture to prove that Jesus is who he says he is, right? And so they threaten him. And then they really threaten him. I'm not too sure the difference. We're really gonna do it this time. And Peter and John go back to their companions and they pray Psalm 2. Don't you realize that this is all in fulfillment of scripture? Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The people gather together against the Lord and his anointed against his Christ. And the whole point of Psalm 2 is, doesn't anyone see how stupid it is to try to declare war on God? It doesn't matter how many you gather, God will always be the majority because there's no way you can gather up enough to fight the infinite almighty. So look on their threats, God, and grant boldness 
to speak your word and then back that up with signs and wonders that your name would be proclaimed and the world is shaken they're filled with the spirit they speak the word of god with boldness again and with great power testify of that resurrection and great grace was upon them all what an amazing church well about this point division starts to become evident it's important to note that there are two different kinds of division. There's the division God causes, and then there's the division man causes. The division man causes is never good in Scripture. But it does say in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen that there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. And there is a multitude. The only time you're really going to find in Scripture that a multitude is doing the right thing, and they are caring, they recognize they have more than they need and they sell it all so that all those who don't can be taken care of. But then there was this couple, remember? A man whose name is to whom God has graciously given, Hananias, and his wife, Sapphire, who sold a piece of property and fake total surrender. And as they feign that forfeiture, they die, drop dead right there. And at that point, things become a little bit strange, as you might imagine. Imagine being a poser would kill you in church. And we read from that point on, the rest, not the multitude, but the rest would not dare join them. And that tells you something. If you knew that God would slay the hypocrite next Sunday, that's a dangerous one because we're going to be out of town, so it isn't like just foretelling you that ahead of time. Would you come? Would you come because you knew that maybe you could fool yourself and you'd rather die than be a poser? You'd rather die than fool yourself or try to fool others or to live in this strange, addicted lifestyle to pretend you're a spiritual giant when really all you are is a carnal human being. Could you imagine if the church where everybody that's a hypocrite dies, those that still live through the service would be very highly respected now, wouldn't they? You come out alive, maybe they would be friends or bosses or co-workers or co-students that would look and go, how did you live through that? And you can imagine people saying, oh no, you don't go to church because you know there's too many hypocrites. You'd say, come to our church, they don't leave that way. And what we find out is, is that's where we're led at this particular point for this particular story. Up to this point, and I want to remind you, a movement of God is a movement of God. There's nothing you have to do to maintain it. There's nothing you can do other than this. Surrender and be a part of it. Just the same way that if you're in the ocean, you cannot command the waves, but you can enjoy them. And you can stare at them all you want. And you could be a poser, but you're going to be found out pretty quick as soon as that wave hits. And in that same way, it's important to recognize that the enemy has been trying to stop this move of God from the very beginning, and it is not stopped. But it is imperative to recognize it was never the responsibility of a Christian to squirt out a miracle. It was our responsibility to proclaim the message it was God's responsibility to bring the backup. Up to this point, who has been our primary spokesperson? Captain Impetuous. The person known for being first to jump, last to see why. And God has used that nature. Now, I'll be honest, I relate a lot to Peter in this. I'm always the first one down the hill, regardless of what's down there, and most of the time I don't know until I get there. And maybe some of you are like that. Don't you for a moment expect God to make you normal. The last thing you want to be is normal. And for some of us, that would be the biggest insult. God has a greater plan for your life, and it is definitely beyond that. And that takes us to our text. It says in verse 12 that through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people so that they were of one accord in Solomon's, and they were of one accord in Solomon's porch. I'd like you to consider in your life, if you have any relationship with your parents, they have a box 
that collects your good intentions. Skates. Tennis rackets. Pom-poms. I mean, that's just Bruno's from his history. Uh, those things that you knew at that moment you were going to be this, a race car driver, an astronaut, or whatever that thing was at that moment. And your parents watched this. And they, if they could afford it and, and cared enough, they, they bought you those things, knowing that they really should have rented them. And they were like, here, if you just go ahead, be a skater, go ahead and be a runner. And let's face it, that doesn't leave us when we get older. How many of you have ever bought a subscription to a health club and used it maybe eight times? And you're like, no, this is the year. This is the time when really we should get the shirt that said we came and we saw and we tried it. And we left. And if you were one of those people like me, not raised a Christian, and you have family that have seen you convert, they're waiting. There's room for your Bible next to the skates and the pom poms and the whatever the thing was that you saw. Guitar hero on your way to becoming a guitar giant or whatever it was. But there's a radical difference as a Christian they don't get. You see, the problem with everything else is we wrapped our hands around it, and somewhere down the line we got tired of holding it, right? We're like, yeah, this doesn't look as cool as it used to. But when I said yes to Jesus, he wrapped his hands around me. Jesus says in John 10, verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me, is, he says, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. Isaiah 40 tells us that God's hand measured the universe. God went, yeah, that, maybe that. And the scientists are saying it's expanding, and I think it's because they can't see. I, 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 there's something I can't wrap my mind around anyways. How do you have an end to a universe? What's on the other side of it? More blank space that's not universe space? I mean, does that make any sense to you? The, the, I, I can't wrap my head around the idea of it being infinite. Like, well, this is the size of the universe. And then beyond that is non-universe. It's just more not space. I mean, I, I, anyways, but somewhere down the line, I went that. And then he went and he said, let's take all of the seas, the oceans and so forth, and put them right here in that little spot right there, and we'll hold them right there. And God goes, okay, let's do that. And you said yes to Jesus, if you have. If not, you'll have that chance today. And God went and he took that same hand and he wrapped it around you. That almighty hand that flung the stars into space, that holds everything in place, with his powerful word, word, and it tells us that God went and he wrapped his hand around it like this, and he went, nobody's getting in here. Nobody. And we're like, oh, Satan was at me last night. And I'm like, well, you might want to read First John because it tells us whoever's been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one doesn't touch him. That doesn't mean he can't scream and yell and try to make it seem like that. But in the end of it all, God says, you're mine. I'm not letting you go. And the rest of the world doesn't get that because nothing else wraps itself around you like that but an addiction. And uh, that's the beauty is that Jesus is my addiction. And I've been trying to overdose on him since I was 19 and I've never been able to. But boy, am I trying. I just love him and I just can't get enough of him. And somewhere down the line, you just, people are waiting. They're waiting to see, Eddie, when are you going to finally turn, go back to that person you were before? To, you know, to, Tune Day, when is it going to be the old thing? And the thing is, is they don't even see the fact that you've been born again and you are growing up in this new thing, this trajectory, and they're kind of looking and they're just waiting. Well, that's where these religious leaders are with these guys. They just keep wondering how long before they give this thing up. And so they start by trying to intimidate the same way that you get excited about Jesus. Someone out there is going to try to intimidate you. That's where they started this. The enemy throws that out and says, hey, if I could get this person to be silent with a cross, look, well, let's do that. And you know, normally, that kind of intimidation, if it doesn't work first from the outside world, God will, God will allow this to strengthen you, but the enemy will come at you to try to shut this down by putting someone you love in your face, 
someone that you've respected maybe, or someone you've honored in one manner or another, someone you've maybe even gone to counsel with before uh, in your life, but now all of a sudden, and, and it may even be somebody that calls himself a Christian that's just telling you, you know, you are going a little overboard with this Jesus thing. And I'm like, you know, can you really ever go overboard with Jesus? What in the world does that look like? And they'll say, well, you can't, you know, have anyone ever said, well, you know, you've, if you're too heavenly minded, you're of no earthly use. And I'd say, if you're not heavenly minded, you're of no earthly use. And somewhere in all of that, people are like, you should really mellow out with this. And I'm like, why? I was certainly not mellow with my destruction. Why would I mellow out with this? And they keep waiting. But when that intimidation didn't work, the enemy throws his second thing, compromise. I'll fake it. Come on, you could fake it. Learn a few of the hallelujahs, sing a few of the songs, memorize a few scriptures. Bang, bada boom, bada bing, you're super Christian. And you know when to raise your hands and you know when to speak in a tongue and you know when to do whatever. And somewhere down the line, sister so-and-so is doing laps because she's full of the Holy Ghost. But meanwhile, somewhere in all of that, because all man can only look at the outside, but it's God who looks at the heart and the enemy goes, go ahead, focus on your presentation. And we've become a very polished version of nothing on the inside. It's like an M&M you bite into with no chocolate. The candy-coated shell is still there, and it's still pretty and shiny, but there's nothing inside. And the enemy goes, come on, do that. And God says, well, let's just deal with that. Bam! And all of a sudden, he just kills a couple people in church, and all of a sudden, you're like, oh, whatever that was, don't do that. And, that was, and God's like, take that seriously, because this is what happens when you fake it. Faking it brings death, whether it happens literally in front of you or not, and God says, don't be messing with that. And you're like, oh, okay, okay, I'm awake, I'm awake, what do we do now? And then the third thing starts happening, and now we go from intimidation to compromise to abuse. Now, they're meeting together, again, house to house and in Solomon's porch. Now, there was an area when the temple was rebuilt by Zerubbabel, it was roughly 4,400 square feet, and Herod went and he leveled the rest of the mountain and did a remodel from something 4,400 square feet to 1.2 million square feet. That's a big remodel. And when he did that, he put this giant courtyard out there that allowed people who weren't Jewish to actually go into the general massive courtyard. And it was named after Solomon because of his influence in the rest of the world. So understand there was a little bit of a barrier that, that actually said if you get past this point and you're not Jewish, your, your deaths and your, your own responsible for your own death. But understand in that, there was this area called Solomon's Colony. That was the area where local teachers taught. And the idea was is that a Jewish leadership allowed local guys to kind of have their own disciples and teach in that area because there was no threat because they hated the Gentiles anyways. So you could put them out there anyways. What difference does it make? And that's where Jesus taught most of the time. When he cleared the temple, he was clearing Solomon's Colony. He was clearing that area that was the big, massive open courtyard where people from the rest of the world were supposed to go and figure out what it really meant to be God's people. And they would seek God in prayer, and they would watch them celebrate and go, man, whatever that is, I want that. And, and understand that's why Jesus took it so seriously. And this is where they're teaching the people, and it says in verse 13, yet none of them dared join them. At that point, you realize what you've got is a bunch of people who are believing Jesus, but afraid to be a part of this radical group, because this group's way too radical, because this is where people die when you kind of just start nodding off. And so with that, it says, but the people esteem them highly. Let's face it, who wouldn't? And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, but they're not joining the group, but they're increasingly added now. Multitudes of both men and women. Notice it says in verse 15, so that. And I'd like you to look at verse 14 and 15 and put them together for a moment because they are one sentence. Listen, Believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick into the streets. So that. So that. That connects those two statements. In other words, it wasn't like he said, hear me on this, believers were increasingly added, and you could tell because of the miracles that were taking place. Believers were increasingly added, so guess what? Tongues were flying. He said believers were increasingly added, and they were so added that you know what you saw as a result of that? People went out and got lost people and brought them in. 
He goes, that was the, clue, the truest proof that somebody actually believed that they realized that something radical was taking place and they were like, well, if something radical takes place and I genuinely believe it, well, then why in the world wouldn't I go and say, well, that person really needs Jesus. Let's get him to where Jesus is. And he goes, those believers were added and you could see it in the way that they responded when they left because they came back and they didn't come back alone. And it says, notice, it gets kind of funky here in this because it says, it's so that they laid this as they came, so that they, so they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches so that at least the shadow of Peter passing by on some of them might fall. What? Wait a minute. Is this dedicated and proved that Peter is the Pope? Why did God make this Peter? What do we know about Peter between chapters 2 and 5? He was, if if you say, you know, every person within the body of Christ is a part of the body, what part of the body would you say Peter is? I'd go there too. I'd say he was the mouth. The one guy you hear saying the message more than anybody else is Peter. He's the messenger so far. He's the guy that every time something happens, he goes, hey, by the way, just want you know, that totally lines up with Scripture. And by the way, you killed Jesus. God raised him from the dead, and you need to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And then something else happens. Oh, this guy, he was like, okay, so he's over 40. He's been lame from birth. But now look at him. He's totally fine. Why is that? Because you killed Jesus, and God raised him from the dead, and you need to put your trust on him. This guy did, and look what happened. Now, understand, why would it not be this guy? And understand, that's what God is connecting here. Because I understand, you know, we go, as a church, wouldn't it be great if we had more miracles? And God says, wouldn't it be great if we had more message? Because if we really believe this message and we believe that we love people, then we would be out there sharing that. But the problem is, but then I'm afraid. God says, of course, that's why I give you the Holy Spirit to get you over yourself so that you could love them more than you're fearful of your own thing. And with that, you get over yourself and you start going, you know what, you really need Jesus. And people go, what the heck is that? We live in a country now that people don't even know what that means. They're like, oh yeah, that's like that Christmas guy, right? They're like, Jesus, Christmas, Easter, cross, that's about all I really know. And you're like, well, what is the cross for? I don't know. It's kind of this story, this fairy tale. It's, it's, I think it's somewhere, I think what happened is he went through a forest, saw three bears, and then somewhere down that he rescued Hansel and Gretel and then died on a cross. Is that about right? I mean, it's like that's where they, they put it all in with that. And we're testifying that Jesus is alive And they're like, well, if he's alive and you know him, well, well, then how are you different? And you're like, well, let me show you. Let me talk about what my life is, what's happening. And that's going to be the whole point in this. Now now you know this as well as I do. Well, what if the person says no? Here's the good news. You can't be a failure because you threw seed and some of it didn't grow. The only way that you can be a failure is by holding on to the seed. Well, I'm afraid it won't all grow. Probably won't. But you can guarantee it won't grow if you keep it in your pocket unless someone throws dirt in there but I'm afraid that I will, I will fail. If you're afraid to fail, then go for it. If you're really that afraid of failure, then being silent would be the biggest failure. Now, look, I'm not trying to guilt anyone into it. I'm just trying to challenge you with this. If people really believe that Jesus changed his lives, as you and I, we claim to be too, well, then certainly somewhere down the line, I think we're going to be vocal about it. And that means that, well, that means someone's going to stand up and resist me. Yeah, probably, but let's be honest. Whose friend do you really want to be and whose opponent? I mean, if you really, in the end of it all, want to disappoint them or do you want to disappoint God? Because in the end of it all, God is raising us up because he wants to transform London. And as he wants to transform London, strange as it is, he wants to use us. And he's like, but I feel ill-equipped. Perfect. But I'm not like that smarter than whatever. Here's the great news. Whatever you think makes you under the actual average is the one thing that qualifies you more than anything according to Scripture. Because God has this tendency to use the underdog because then God gets the glory. So somewhere down the line in all of this, Peter's proclaiming a message. Imagine how weird this would be. Peter's out in the sun. He's sharing, okay, and you need to give your life to Jesus. And he transforms people. And all of a sudden, something happens. Cobus, for a moment, you know, he, like he starts to have an aneurysm. Blood starts squirting out of his ears. His eyes start getting all nasty red. And he's like, ah, and people are like, oh, no. And then all of a sudden, he falls into the shadow of Peter. And he's like, oh, I'm fine. And he gets back over. And people go, whoa, that was crazy. Somewhere down the line, somebody had to start that, right? Somewhere down the line, someone had to fall into that shadow. Imagine Peter's walking down the street and he's preaching Jesus. And as he's preaching Jesus, just whoever happens to be laying there, 
crossing his shadow. All of a sudden it's like, yeah, I want that. And they get up and they get up and they get up. How cool would that be to watch? But nowhere in this do people start building monuments to Peter. Because everyone starts to glorify God, which tells me that the message is so overtly proclaimed that people get it. They're like, you need to give your life to Christ. You need to give your life to Christ. He transforms people. If you put your trust in Jesus, he'll transform them. Let me remind you, Peter was the guy who grabbed this guy by the hand that was born lame and lifted him up. People already know that trusting in Jesus changes people. That guy's testimony of it. And a lot of people watch that. A lot of people saw that. And as a lot of people saw that, people go, whoa, whatever's happening, that guy's telling me something I need to hear. And with that then, Notice that doesn't mean everyone's going to stand up and, and, and hurrah you for it because there's a group of people out there that, hear me on this, their entire mindset is based on a lie. Everything that their life is built on, based on a lie. And you are proving it. So why wouldn't they fight you tooth and nail if they really want to hold on to the lie? It got to the point where it says, look at verse 16. Also, beyond the, the shadow people that are just trying to find Peter's shadow, here's the great part. Imagine, could, could you picture this. And by the way, for the moment, it's almost like we look Puritan. Thank you, some lady sitting on this side and guys sitting. I like kind of look over and I'm like, well, okay. Anyways, so imagine if you will, let's just put a couple of people to it. Let's put Emma and let's put Lois. Could you imagine the two of them for a moment? And they look and they're like, oh my goodness, Peter's coming to town. He's going to be preaching Jesus. That's like a given. And with that, oh, you know what? Lois is like, I've got to sit grandma. Okay. So imagine, if you will, grandma can't get up out of bed. Don't worry about it, grandma. We've got it taken care of. So imagine if they will, they head over to Ireland. I'm assuming that's where your grandmother is. And, uh, you know, whatever. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden, you, and, and here's like Peter, and he's walking by and he's preaching the gospel. And all of a sudden, you see Lois and Emma chasing Peter with Grandma in tow. And they're like, come on, we gotta get there, we gotta get there, we gotta get there, we gotta get there. And you're like, Grandma, bloop! And they just dump her into, this, into the line in the trajectory of the shadow and go, get up, Grandma, this is it, this is it right here, Grandma. I mean, how amazing would that be? But the moment you see that happen once, then at that point, you're like, Eddie and, and Viola are like, oh, well, we've got this friend, and he's, okay, but, but they, you, you start going, well, wait a minute, okay, so, okay, but grandma, like, grandma had gout, okay, so gout gets healed, but, but well, what about, what about this problem, okay, the, he, the guy that was lame, he could get up, okay, we could see that, but, oh, wait a minute, and, you know, and all of a sudden, Bruno and Agnes are like, you know, we happen to know this person that's blind, well, let's see if he does the blind thing, let's see if the blind thing happens, and see how we start segmenting it now, but wait a minute, what about those that are just, like, emotionally weird, what about that? You know, I mean, there's that, you know, where we feel like this is just like far, far beyond this. Well, what about that? Well, let's, well, let's find out. I mean, would you go to that point? Here's the cool thing. If somebody really is that funky, well, let's face it, you, you don't have anything to lose with a person like that. So, hey, I just want to bring you to Jesus. Here we go. And all right, whoa. I said, hey, wow. Well, what about this person? They, I think they're possessed. Okay, well, let's find out how that works. Is there any part of you that has that spirit? Because there isn't me. There is that part of me that goes, let's just see how far. And all of a sudden you go, well, I don't know, man. I think Jesus does the lame thing. I think Peter can do the lame thing, but I'm not really sure about the blind thing. And you go, well, you know, I don't know if I could minister to you because I've never been blind. To be honest, I'm sorry to tell you, my eyesight's pretty good. Or, you know, well, okay, it's getting a little, you know, now I need your glasses when I read but I don't know if that's enough for me to relate to you. I mean, let's be honest. In the end of it all, what these disciples knew was if we could get him to Jesus, he could fix him. And you're like, but wait a minute, what about me? I'm struggling. I have this thing I still battle. Well, please hear me in this. There are areas where God will just punch it and drive it away. And there are other areas where God will carry you through it. Have you noticed that? Remember the two storms that the disciples were put in? Both, by the way, in obedience. But the first one, if you remember, they came to Jesus and just said, we're gonna die, don't you care? We're dying here. We're in jeopardy. And they'll look and go, man, where's your faith? So the first time, they're just like, don't let me die in it. But the second one, nobody says that to Jesus. Oh, well, who wants to get rebuked on that one twice? The second time, they just couldn't get to the other side. Jesus, the second time, he's walking on the water, if you remember, and he ultimately gets in the boat. And the moment he gets into the boat, they get to the other side. And listen, 
There are times in our young walk with Christ, all we really want is the storm gone. Let's be honest. Just get me out of this storm. I'm going to die in this thing. Don't you care? And he's like, where's your faith? But as we grow, there are times where you're like, Lord, just get me to the other side of this one. You may not take it away. And it may be a long journey, but I trust in this. As long as you're in the boat, we're going to get to the other side of this. And we're just dumping people. We're dumping them because we're just convinced, no matter, it's like, well, I don't know what your problem is. I don't need to know what your problem is. It isn't that I don't care. The point is, is I know who the one who solves every problem. If I could just get you to him, one way or another, he's going to get a hold of you and change you. Verse 17 says, the high priest, on the other hand, he's pretty upset. This Jesus being alive thing wasn't just an irritant to the tenets of their distinctives. It was dynamite to their foundation. None of that afterlife hocus pocus stuff with us. We're way too brilliant. We're way too smart. We're way too educated for that nonsense. That's where the Sadducees were. And a living Jesus shows them that all that they cling to as intellects and erudites, it's fantasy. And so you're like, you know what? I believe we can make our own good. I believe, I mean, we, I, my wife was telling me about this interview she was watching because some of you are aware of what's going on in California right now. Roughly half of Wales is on fire. That gives you an idea right now how much has been burned. And they went down to the area near uh, Malibu and they asked the woman there, how are you going to get through this? Lost her house in the fire. Everything's gone. She says, magic. And the interviewer goes, magic? She goes, yeah, the magic of love. And I was so waiting for a Disney song to start out of that. And I just, and my heart just breaks as I hear that. Have you ever talked to anyone and actually just taken it four degrees? Four degrees, in other words. So let me say, on the side of eternity, how are you doing? Good. I'm a, you know, are you going to be okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Why? Because I'm a good person, okay? What makes you a good person? Well, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this. Okay, so how does that make you good? Where's the level start then? And I'm just taking it to four degrees, four questions, each one developing the last one. So where's your good, so where does the line draw? Well, I think that anyone could draw their own line, really. Well, wouldn't anyone draw their line where they win? So heaven's going to be filled with people like that person, that crazy person, and that murderer, and that thing. I mean, they would do that, right? Because you never really think about it beyond that. You usually just kind of have your sort of Christian pepper spray. You know, you ask, and they're just like, Psh! and then they think you'll stop. People have a, quite a right to ask us that. So you believe in this Jesus thing, sure. What, like this guy that's Middle Eastern, and he spoke Hebrew or Aramaic, you know, 2,000 years ago thousands of miles away, 5,400 miles away, and like, you know him now? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Why? How would you know a guy? Do you know anyone else that long ago? No, actually, you haven't met anyone else. They, they're all dead. So what makes this guy different? Well, to be honest, he happens to be God in the flesh. Well, anybody can make that claim what made him different. Well, let's talk about that. I'm glad you asked. Well, first of all, there was no disease or any problem that he could ever actually not handle. He healed everything in front of him. Then I go, but let's just go with the, uh, the obvious. What's the one thing that equalizes every human being? Death. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. You may actually be more comfortable, but in, by the time you get to your casket, you're still going to be the same. Everybody has an appointment with death. The only difference is Jesus actually got up out of that and nobody else does. Oh, and there's all, we can talk about prophecy and how people from from all over the place, from thousands of miles away and for hundreds and, th and literally thousands of, of years in between are prophesying and how they all culminate with this simple and single entity. There's so many beautiful places to go with it, but in the end of it all, people have a right to ask, but we should engage them in that conversation. And you're like, well, what if I can't answer every question? Refresh them by telling them you don't know. Have you ever realized, are you ever afraid that that's where your failure is? Don't you realize the failures and dishonesty? I don't have to answer the questions of the universe because contrary to what other people think, I'm actually not running my own universe. 
So I actually don't need to know. I also don't need to know all of the things about aerodynamics to actually be confident that a pilot can get me from one place to another. Well, the high priest rose up and those who were with him from the sect of the Sadducees and they were filled with indignation. The word for indignation, by the words, was zealous. We get the word zeal from it. The guy was literally boiling over is the way that it says that. And they laid their hands on the apostles. Notice it doesn't just say Peter and John. This is the first time that it's gone much larger than that. And now it's a full-scale arrest of the apostles. We'll assume that's the 12. And if that's the 12, does that mean Matthias? Remember the guy they picked in chapter 1? Well, that guy's like, wow, what did I join? And now all 12 of them are actually put here, and it says, and he put them in the common prison. And my first thought is, wait a minute, the high priest has a prison? Imagine it's like, let me show you around. Here's the dining room. Here's the big screen. Oh, and there, that's the prison. That's where we put people that bother us. I mean, I, any person that has a prison in their house it should be concerned. I don't know. That's just my attitude. But they arrest them. There are guards that are guarding. That's clear and evident from this. And it says, at night, the angel of the Lord opened the doors and brought them out. Now, what's going to become clear and evident the next time we open this text and I love where it goes, by the way, because what it shows is all those other people who are so trying to keep things into control have no control whatsoever. To the point where the guards are completely unaware that they're gone. Now, Peter's in there, right? I mean, I thought is, shouldn't it at least be unusually quiet? You're thinking, oh yeah, we arrest those. But common prison, what does it mean? Why is it so important that it's the common prison versus like an uncommon prison? Because the common prison means that they weren't the only 12 that were put in there. The common prison means that's where you throw all of the ruckus, if that makes sense. You know, those, it's sort of, think of it as sort of, it's 2 a.m. and the police are just scooping up anybody that's causing trouble and throwing them in the same cell. Which one of you wants to be in that cell? And that means all the trouble, that means all the people who are kind of hurling, all the people who are in fist fights, all of the people who are freaking out over whatever the thing is, they're all in the same cell and you're there with them. And imagine somewhere down the line, an angel kind of you know, just opens up the door and goes, you, 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 coming. Now, are the rest of the guys aware of this? Or maybe they're just so wasted they don't understand this. But imagine, can imagine Peter's like, oh man, well, this guy's crazy or whatever, should we share with him? And all of a sudden he's like, Gotta go, see ya. And then, you know, and all of a sudden, off they go. <clears throat> and somewhere in that, the guards are completely unaware. Now, what happened there? Now, can we be honest? This is one of those moments I want to see on film when we get up there. You know, it's like, Lord, can you show me this moment? There's a few of those moments, and this is one of them. And there's going to be another one later on with Peter, a little spoiler alert, where you get these kind of moments where it's like God just does that, and it's like, are there, all of the guards are just going like, and they're like frozen? You know, is it just sort of like, I mean, would you be like, as Peter, you're like, ah, da, 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 da. you know, as you're walking out, or you're just like, don't bother him, don't bother him, don't bother him, you know, or whatever. And the angel's just like, come on, come on, guys. Here's the weird part. This is going to happen here with all 12 of them. And then Peter's going to be arrested later. The other 11 are going to be, you know, praying. The angel leads them out, and Peter doesn't even realize it's real. The other of them are going to be told that Peter's released, and they're not going to believe it, but they all experienced it here. Is there a part of you that goes, oh yeah, we've done that before. That's not that weird. And isn't it kind of weird how the Lord could deliver you from something and take you out of some form of horrible holding cell in your own life, some addiction, some horrible thing, and then somewhere down the line he wants to do it to someone else, and you still have doubts? Like, I don't know, you could do it to somebody else. Or worse yet, you, kinda, you have another bout with some weird thing, and you're like, I don't know if the Lord can get me out of it this time. Funny, he got you out of it the last. But please hear me in this. Somehow, however this happened, and the Bible does not tell us, which is good news, because otherwise we'd build some really wacky doctrine on that. Somewhere down the line, an angel comes in, takes him out, and nobody else seems to notice. However cool that happens, did they walk through walls? Did they, anyways, I don't know. But, and I'll try not to Jones on it. Here's the point in all of it. There's someone on the line, he says, because there's a purpose, and for this purpose, you're gonna need to be free from this prison to do it. I'm gonna deliver you, please hear me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull you out of this cell because there's a purpose behind this, and you're gonna need to be free for that to happen. Now, what I've learned is there are other times where the Lord will allow you to endure a trial, and the Lord says, I need you to endure this trial because actually that's where your platform is to speak. Here's the weird part. We bemoan either. Now we're like, ah, oh, I want to be free. And then God frees you. And then you have to be responsible with the life that he gives you. And someone out he goes, I want you to use that as a platform of how I've delivered you. And you're like, I don't want to share about that. And the Lord's like, but 
look at what you experienced, other people need to know there's freedom in. And then there are other people that, I mean, to be honest, am I the only one here that has ever met or read somebody that was dying of something but trusted Christ through the entire experience and was radically blessed by them in a way that you couldn't have been had they just been healed? Some of my heroes were people that I knew deteriorated in front of me physically but never let go of God. And I watched it space by space by space by space, season by season. And in all of that, I think, what a hero to see this and what a tremendous source of encouragement and strength and fortification to see that. And the only reason I say that is, is that the Lord could do either in your life, but why would we fight him in either? The angel says, I'm releasing you because there's a purpose. And here's the purpose. Notice what it says. And this is our last verse for today is just verse 20. He brought him out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people. All the words of this life. Now let me ask you, what would you say? How much of it would be about church versus Jesus? How much of it would be about a song versus Jesus? How much of it would be about the power of prayer or the way you speak in a tongue or whatever versus Jesus? Imagine Peter could have said, well, and then I healed this guy and you should have seen the whole shadow thing. It was like people were like bringing up big lights just to try to bring bigger shadows so the more people, I mean, imagine the things you could say that were self-elevating, but in that it's like, well, this is what I need you to do. And what we're gonna find out ultimately is that they're gonna be, what the, what the reason the religious leaders are going to be so upset, of course, is because all they wanna to want to talk about is Jesus. See, it's all just that. Remember when he says that, look, it's since you were raised with Christ, set your mind on things above. Put your heart on those, on those things above because you died and your life is now hidden in Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. That's Colossians 1, or 3, 1 through 3. And the whole idea of it is, is that if Jesus really is your life, as Paul could say, to live is Christ and to die is gain, and people say, talk about this life, you're like, well, then we are gonna talk about Jesus, right? No, no, you can't talk about Jesus. Well, then we can't talk about my life. Well, come on, isn't there other parts? Not really, no. No, really, it's all Jesus. So hear me on for a second here, and we're gonna go to prayer, but hear me. Imagine somebody sitting down with you and going, okay, they're in the temple. Three years ago, this itinerant Judean prophet from Galilee introduced himself into our lives. We chose to follow him. Wherever he went, wherever we went, he healed. He touched, transformed, they came from everywhere to be healed, except maybe the religious leaders. They came to surmise the threat that he was to the status quo. We watched every person from every state of life, every, state of life, every station, every low place come to him, and he openly received them all, but he, he never left them the way they came. Everybody came to be changed, except maybe those religious leaders. They actually came to keep things the same. We watched some of those leaders, though, sneak up to Jesus at night, inquire and ask. And they did ask with open heart. And Jesus would always answer, and he answered them with an invitation to a brand new life. And we watched the world separate, really, into three simple groups. There were those who chose to follow him. There were those who wanted just a quick fix. And there were those who wanted to stop him. And we decided again, we were going to be the ones who followed him. And then we watched many who actually chose to follow him walk away when they learned what was really, really required. But we chose to follow him anyways. Convinced that he alone had the words of life, we chose to follow him still. We watched the religious leaders join hands with the very ones they condemned, the Romans, to overcome him. What a strange union the religious world and the secular world to fight God in the flesh. And we watched Judas, one of our own, lead the guards straight to him at night to privately arrest him. We watched him whipped without confession, beaten without retaliation, spat upon without threat, and crucified whilst begging the Father for their forgiveness. We watched the religious leaders mock and rejoice as he hung and bled and died. And we hid. Yeah, we hid. We hid fearing we would be next. 
Then we watch Jesus break through all of our locked doors and barricades to show that even death, the universe's greatest threat, was impotent to him. We watched him to ascend to heaven to the Father's right hand and to intercede for us now and to go prepare a place for us. So let me ask you, what threat could this life throw at us now? What weapon could they forge to stop this? We've chosen to follow him, cross and toe, knowing he's preparing a place for us that this universe ticking to extinction is no threat. And if it's no threat, then what else could be? Could you tell us your life, the day that Jesus introduced himself into your life? and how you chose to follow him. Not just accept an offer like a sales pitch and then go back to living the way you were before, but follow him. And how he healed, how he restored, how he transformed. Could you tell us that? Could you tell us how he carried you through when there was no other way, because he's a way out of no way? Could you tell us of how he brought peace when no earthly peace could possibly reside? Could you tell us of how he gave you forgiveness for somebody you would have never forgiven otherwise? Could you tell us how he brought hope when your whole life was consumed in hopelessness? Strength when you were completely absorbed in weakness? Could you tell about how he gave you love for people you would naturally hate? Because the world's starving for that, you know. And the only part of the equation that's yours is the part that testifies of how he changes people. And you're like, but I may not have all the answers. You have the answers that mean the most. You see, what you learn is when you give your testimony to somebody, in our culture, people have a hard time wanting to try to shoot that down because they know it's disrespectful. And if they've known you long enough, they've clearly seen some form of change. And if they haven't, they're welcome to observe from this point because here's the good news. Your change will never be done on this side of the planet. Have you learned that? What that means is, hey, I could tell you about all the things Jesus has done to change me to this far, but you haven't known me, but I'll still tell you. But if you walk with me from this point forward, you're going to see more change. Because this isn't a stance, this is a walk. And that's a trajectory, and I am still being conformed into his image. And you have to deal with the evidence in front of you of my own personal transformation. He didn't set you free for you to wander. He set you free for you to witness. And you go, but what if they hate me for it? You know, the same people that hate you now will love you later when they finally surrender. Because if you are as convinced as I am that that's the answer, Jesus, and not an answer, but the answer, then you don't back down like a good doctor would say, this is the one thing that cures you. No matter how much you mock it and resist it, this would cure you. And you can mock me all you want and so forth, but there's going to be a day you're going to be tired of fighting this. And when that's the case, I will be the one doctor that's never changed my tune because I know this fixes it. And you can run to other countries and start sniffing avocado pits and grinding, you know, donkey manure and rubbing it in the inside of your eyelids or whatever the other things are and poke yourself full of needles and walk on hot coals all you want. But in the end of it all, when you're tired of trying everything else, you'll come more scarred. You'll definitely come more exhausted and you'll come with, you'll come more broke. But in the end of it all, I want to remind you, this is still here and I will be waiting with it. But at least you need to know this is the answer and I have it and I want to share it. The rest is up to you. 
Jesus died on the cross because your filth and my filth needs to be punished. And the only God that punishes all wrong is a righteous judge, but the only righteous judge that still saves people is the one who acts in love. And only our God provided a provision. And that provision is that He Himself would step into our stead, pay the price for us, die on the cross, rise again, and offer us that payment for our sins. That is the cure. That is the pay for our debt. And the only thing that's left is whether you're going to be too proud to not accept somebody paying your debt. But we're all aware of the fact that pride is stupid when help is offered and you need it. Pride is your detriment. And you can die proud or you can live rescued. And I just want to pray for us. Have you accepted that gift? Have you accepted the gift of Jesus Christ? Because that gift is offered right now and I want you to know He transforms and I'm proof of it. You would have never got me up here sharing anything had it not been that. We would have never moved to this country and had the beautiful privilege of being able to serve you beautiful people had it not been for Jesus Christ. I wouldn't have lived long enough to be able to do this anyways. There would have been a funeral none of you would have gone to because you would have not known me. And that's the story for many of you I know. How he's carried you, how he's delivered you, how he's strengthened you, how he's given you peace. And when the world can't find peace and they look to you, and let's face it, the same people who mock you will call you when their mom gets cancer. They know that your answer is simple. And that's good news. Now look, at, I'm not asking, do you want a quick fix from Jesus, a quick buzz? I remind you, that was another group. Are you going to follow him with me? Because if you're going to follow him with me, we're going to meet a lot of really colorful people. We're going to go a lot of really colorful places. And we're going to have memories we could not, that other people will not believe when we share them. Could you imagine? People have a hard time believing this. Imagine going, I was there when people jumped in Peter's shadow. When they rolled in Peter's shadow because they couldn't jump. And then they jumped out. I was there when he lifted that guy up. You should have seen that. Could you imagine the stories? And people are like, oh, come on, shut up. And you're like, no, I'm telling you. You know what? You want to see for yourself? Let's go. And you're like, well, what if I lay hands on someone and they don't get better? Don't you think that they'll care enough to see that you lay hands on them in the first place? Ask the Lord, Lord, do you want to heal this person? And if so, let's do this. Come on, let's bring it on. But he does want to show himself strong to anyone whose hearts are loyal to him. And he will show himself strong, I guarantee you that. And we've watched God deliver people from everything, from cancer to growing things in front of us. That's not that weird to me anymore. To me, the weirdest thing is watching people love each other. Because to me, that's a greater miracle than I, and you, you know, you, you could still be a nasty, rotten self and get your arm back and then still be a nasty, rotten self with two arms. But when you watch people selflessly love each other, to me, there's, that's just a fantastic miracle that the rest of the world scratches their heads on. Well, we're going to pray. We're going to pray if you haven't accepted Christ that you'll have to make that choice today to say yes, to follow him. But if you have said yes, my prayer is God would empower us to get over ourselves. And when we get over ourselves, that we would, as God says here, that those believers prove their belief by this. They went out. And you're like, well, if, if you're afraid to tell people, bring them to a place where you know they'll hear it. Well, pray with me, would you please? <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you here for the opportunity to open your word and expect you to speak and how you've spoken to my heart today. I thank you, Lord, for the fact that this angel didn't just release them. He was responsible for a message because that's even what an angel is by virtue of his name and title. And now we forget that you've made us messengers. You've made us people to declare your good news. And I think of the lepers 
in the king's books that while everyone's starving in Jerusalem, head out to the camp and find that all of the army has fled and they're feasting, gorging themselves on all of that food and then realize what they're doing isn't right because everyone else is starving to death in this city. And I pray we would get to that point, Lord, that first we would dive in head first and heart first and allow you to satiate everything. And as you consume us in that, Lord, as we see all of those things met, Lord, will then make us, fill us with that compassion for others to go and let them know where, where the, those who are starving right now for love and joy and peace and hope. where that could be found in complete and absolute abundance. And that's in you, Jesus. And I pray for every one of us here, Lord, that we would demonstrate our faith in those very things, Lord, that we would expect you to touch lives, Lord, and we don't even have to know how. We don't even have to know what it is, Lord, and how you're gonna transform them, but we do know this, that if we can get people to you, you could fix them. And and Lord, so I pray for those right now who are battling with the enemy, trying to convince them that they've been rejected or second class because there's still some battle they're fighting. They're still somehow in the boat in a storm. And, and in that, they just, they feel like something has failed. And I pray, Lord, that if what they're really just praying is to be removed from the storm, but what you're really seeking to accomplish is actually to give them peace in the storm, that you would redirect their focus, knowing that however the position you want them in will be to bring forth the greatest amount of dividend of their witness to those around them. And we don't want to stand before you fruitless, Lord. And you don't want us standing before you fruitless. You want us to be used to touch the lives of those we claim to love around us. Let it be more about that, Lord, than it is about some kind of weird entitlement we've given ourselves. And I pray, Lord, today that you would empower us to demonstrate our faith by bringing that out to others. So consume us with compassion for the human race that we would be bold, that we would have that reckless love to go out with less concern of our own personal uh, dignity and more concern for their salvation. And here in this room, if you've not accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, I remind you, the bill's paid and Jesus paid it at the cross for all of your guilt. Buried and rose again on the third day, just like Scripture promised all of this. And offers you a brand new life free from the tyranny of free from the despotism of that sin, you could be set free and made new and then hand your life over to Jesus. And if you hand your life over to Jesus right now, he's gonna transform you. He is gonna, from the inside out, transform you. And you know that God's speaking to you right now on this. You know right now that you've watched other people waiting for them to sort of throw that Bible in with the rest of the good intentions they've had over the years, but they but they don't, they're not leaving that. And you recognize that there's something radically different. And, and if that's you, just pray this prayer with me right now. Look, God will convince you, just let him. And if you just pray, God, I'm a sinner. That makes me guilty before you. But Jesus paid for that guilt on the cross. And when he died, my bill was paid. And he was buried and rose again. And he offers me new life. And I say yes. Have my life. Make it yours. I hand it to you now. Confessing Jesus as my Lord. So I'm yours, in Jesus' name. And if you agree, I ask you to say, amen. Lord, you've heard us. And I pray that we would celebrate you all the more. Give us the courage and the compassion 
to be bold as you call us to. And further challenges as we continue to go through this book in the, the weeks to come. That we would recognize that the enemy could never stop a movement of you. The question is just whether we want to be a part of it or not. So Lord, as we sing one last song and dismiss, I just pray that you would bless this time and bless us to bless others. In Jesus' name.